So um, I, I'm from Armidale, and I'll get to that shortly. In fact, I think I can get to that now. Righto. Okay, so I'm from a place called Armidale, which for those of you that aren't familiar with, uh, with our neck of the woods, is up in, in the New England. It's a plateau about a kilometre off the deck. Uh, cockroach you may like. Uh, I am from northern New South Wales, and Mr Mayor, I'm, I'm really annoyed actually. I thought Elton was coming tonight. But uh, it's obviously end of September, so I'll make sure I book that one in, not. But anyway, I, I, I would have come back for a sherbet for sure. <clears throat> I was actually born and bred in a place called Aubrey down the Riverina, so um, we've always wondered why the coastline was so flat in the north of the country. And um, I'll be honest, it's, it's my first visit to Mackay, and I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to come up and, uh, and to meet you all and have a look around. And, and what a vibrant gathering, what a vibrant industry you've got. Now, um, I've got a few confessions to make. First of all, it, it's come out. I'm a physicist by trade. In, in fact, I'm a, uh, I'm a plasma physicist. That's someone that plays with lots of high voltage. Um, and I'm actually an identical twin. Uh, now, what I'm going to say here is that um, you've all got very finely tuned bullshit meters. Uh, you know, you can't put much over growers. So um, let's just see how we go. Anyway. I'm all right, well, if you start with the challenges, so the big challenges we face, um, is the fact that farmers are time poor. They've got a lot, on their, a lot on their plate. They're generally older, getting tired in life, and they're, um, they're under enormous pressure. The environmental dimensions of what they're doing, the, the social license to farm, how they farm, and of course, they're being confronted with a deluge of technology and talk around big data, and it's not surprising that many farmers are overwhelmed by it. And, and if you bear in mind, as I mentioned earlier, that they're in their mid-50s on average, then, you know, this is not the population that can easily create and reinvent themselves. So this is where the smart services sector really can kick in. And, uh, and all of these young agronom agronomists, all of these people developing technology and processes, never forget who you're serving, that is the farmer, and come up with custom-made solutions that will help them deal with what they need to do. It's just a very difficult time for them. So you're part of the research end of the spectrum where you're out there and you're trying to quantify things. Who are you working with to actually deliver some of the products and the tech advantages to the farmers? Well, we are a research group so we, and we have a role uh, in, the, in the whole matrix of what's going on in, in innovation and agriculture. Everything we do um, is, involves industry stakeholders, that is the end in mind that I mentioned, start with the end in mind, but also carries with it um, partnership partnerships in terms of who are going to be out there in the marketplace delivering the solutions that we that we work as part of the solution of. So, Craig, I'm tripping over myself there, let me just think a bit about this. So, okay, so we're a research group, we have a role to play. Um, everything we do, our research is done via industry funding, involves commercial stakeholders. Not only the farmers that we serve, the grower groups that help us extend what we do, but more importantly, the people in the marketplace who will effectively convey those solutions out there to the farmers. So we have a saying in our group, if there's no market failure, stay the hell out of it. In other words, there are challenges that need to be met that need scientific research skills brought to bear, but we're not in the business of creating gadgets for the marketplace or offering services to the marketplace. That's where our partnership comes in. So the thing is, when you're asked to give presentations, you sort of got to think, well, okay, where am I now? Where have I come from? And what do I think? What do I think about the future? Now, let's face it. Can I have a show of hands? How many here is in the 15 to 25 age bracket? Oh, God. And a couple of damn good liars too, I might add. How about 25 to 40 age bracket? How about the 40 pluses? Okay, so there's a fair few of us who don't buy green tomatoes in this game, do we? Well, when you get to this age, as Paul Keating said, you know, he used to always go around interviewing the old pollies. When Paul Keating first entered politics, he used to go and visit all the old crusty pollies because he believed in, in, in collecting what they call congealed wisdom. So when you're talking about the future of ag tech, there is a lot of congealed wisdom here in this room. And I can guarantee you, you men and women of that age bracket, don't go retiring any time soon. And I'll come back to the reason why shortly. My brother and I, of course, we're in the sort of the early 30s, heading on to the late 50s. Yeah, I get you. <clears throat> now, my brother's career culminated when he went to Iraq. He, he's a, I'm the lover, he's the fighter. And if you meet our wives, you'll understand entirely why. But um, I don't get on too well with my sister-in-law, I might add. But um, 
he decided it was much safer to head off to Iraq. And, um, and the thing was, at the, at the end of 35 years in the military, he decided he, he had his oil fire moment. You've heard about oil fire moments? You just sit there and think, what the hell? Now, coincidentally, my brother was doing a bit of precision ag at the time. He was doing a bit of drone work as well. But where I was, I'm using drones to pick up crops. He was sort of he sort of become aware that the enemy has a predilection for donkeys and a few other things. So, and we'll come back to that a little later on. But he had his oil fire moment, and I've had mine as well. And I guess in a way that's what I'm here to here to, here to chat about. Because when I look back at 25 years in the precision ag game, now remember in the early 1990s when precision agriculture first kicked up, we thought we were the cheese if we plugged a GPS the size of a shoebox um, under the seat of a harvester because you couldn't get them up high, they would kill you if they fell on you. We thought we were the cheese. And agriculture nowadays, our technology-assisted agriculture future is nothing like it, is, it was in those days. It was a lot simpler. So my oil fire moment is really, when you look at farming, what are we going to leave our kids? Is farming the game that we all started in? Now, um, in the New England, uh, I, we run a few sheep. We, we have to have paddock lice around the place and, uh, and cattle. And, um, and I look at the way farming is going, and it's nothing like when I first started. And, of course, you know, that, I haven't even got my old man started on that subject. He'd be here for days. But, uh, you know, what will we leave our kids? Is this whole future around technology and virtual reality going to be what farming is? I, I sure as hell hope not. And I'll come back to that shortly. I had two formative moments. So I didn't have my all-fire moment. I had two formative moments. The first one was when I was a young, impressionable graduate in 1985. I went to my first ever conference. Now, I was a physicist, right? So we thought driving a station wagon up and down King's Cross, um, hanging out with our grey leather ties and our 80s quaffs, we thought that was the best thing you could do, being country kids in, the, in town. What we forgot about was the fact that we'd hit a roux going down, so we had a big streak of roux shit down one side. <laughs> but we also had the University of New England leakles on the car at the same time. So we did cop a bollocking from the old prof when we got there. But... One of the formative moments I had was this guy. This guy is Professor Klaus von Klitzing. He received the Nobel Prize in 1988 for the discovery of the quantum Hall effect. It's a physical thing. I won't get too excited about it. But this guy turned up at this conference and he put his Nobel medallion on the overhead projector because that's all we had at the day. And he said, listen, you lot. He said, you're all into physics. You're all into mass. That's good. But he said, you know, you've got to bear in mind, but don't get caught up in modelling, you know, Bear in mind what's going on out in the real world. He said, you know, modelling's a bit like masturbation. He said it in a German accent, I can't do it well. He said, you know, if you do it long enough and hard enough, you'd swear it was better than the real thing. And that's the problem with, with a lot of science nowadays. We're not getting kids outdoors. Right? Okay. Funny thing is, when you look at space, you're looking in the past. The further you look in space, the deeper you look in space, the further back in time you go. Ironically, when we put technology in the air in space and we're looking down, we want to see into the future, not the past. And, the, and pound for pound, when you look at the way science and, and this industry is going, is there's more money to be made looking into the future than there is to be looking at the present time today. And so, you know, the thing about the sugar industry, for example, is that in terms of using tools like what we have in space looking down, you're, you're ahead of the game. You've got mature crop forecasting tools that work at all scales. And in fact, from time to time, we even managed to get the forecasts right. Um, I might add, uh, and this is a good friend and colleague of mine, Andrew Robson, who's in our group. Um, every now and then we have our Eda Karina moment. Um, oop, I think I just had one then. And, um, you know, whilst we can predict the yield in, uh, in most regions within about 10% um, ahead of the season, um, every now and then, nature throws up a, a bomb at you. And so you get your Rita Karina moment. And, um, but nonetheless, the industries, in terms of comparison with other industries, using this sort of technology is well ahead of the game. And of course, it's all about the nutrition and nutritional management. And these sort of tools are being developed f from satellites well above. So the whole notion of space exploration takes on a different view when you consider being up looking down. Right, that's enough being serious. Um, I have a totally different approach to your forecasting. In the early 90s and, and through to 2000, every year we used to get our students who we were teaching precision ag to learn how to use spatial data. They would use the software to, to, to create maps from satellite imagery and they, they would put in tram lines to control vehicles up and down. And we quickly twigged to the fact that, that you could actually design in a 
geographic information system, a control map for anything. So, for example, in 1999, we actually designed and persuaded a local farmer to cut a huge wallaby into his canola field, right? one kilometre from toe to tail. And, um, and, um, and in fact, that was the year that we won the World Cup in France. So not only did we forecast the outcome, but we got a fistful of free jerseys from the returning wallabies, which we auctioned off for charity. OK, so as a researcher, this event is critical. This is, this is essential pulse taking. In other words, it offers the opportunity for researchers like myself and my colleagues to come in, talk to the producers that are struggling with the challenges they have to meet. And that is not only just the ones that want to innovate today or the ones that already started to innovate yesterday. These are producers who are coming in trying to understand where they can go forward in, in improving their own business of farming and, and meeting all of those challenges. So the opportunities are enormous for people like myself because we get to hear firsthand what the challenges are. We get to talk to the agronomists that are trying to broker those solutions. And we talk to the technologists that are offering up potential solutions in the marketplace. So we can find our niche, what are the unanswered questions, and then we can go back, engage our partnership base, many of whom come from the regions that we've just been talking to, for example here, and get on with the problem, with the business of doing what we do best, which is, which is meeting research challenges. So we should never take the human out of the, out of the equation. So when I'm talking about ag future, we're too, we hear about the internet of things, you know, 30, uh, sorry, uh, 15 trillion dollars contributed to, jo to global GDP by 2030 through the Internet of Things. Farming's never mentioned in any of it, I might add. But this is an industry, for example, the sugar industry, where telemetry and telemetry systems are really taking hold. I mean, on our smart farm, we have 7,000 acres back home. You know, 100 soil moisture probes scattered around. The whole thing chatters away to itself. And it's a living and breathing soil moisture map. This is, this is a half a million dollar asset, which you will now be able to deploy for, for $20,000 or $30,000. That's how fast things are moving. Once you get your measurement down to the scale at which things vary in your paddocks, then you'll start finding that that modelling, the stuff that would normally send you blind, starts actually making sense. You can really start hanging some good numbers on your prediction, in our case, of pasture growth rate, for example, or in, even in yield forecasting. So the Internet of Things is a really important part of our future. Right? I mean, if you've got your land lit up, then, for example, we've got people around our country who are plugging meters, uh, sap flow sensors into the side of trees and measuring the water pumped up and down trees every day. That blue zigzag is a daily heartbeat of a tree. Sun comes up, water pumps up. Sun goes down, water stops. Some even goes back to the roots. Stringy barks, like what we have on our country at home, can pump between 30 and 70 litres of water out of the ground a day. Okay, if the roots are shallow and you have the very pale green zigzags, see how they're growing over time, they kick in and start pumping the tree. And that's when the tree starts its flush of growth. But interestingly enough, showed that to a farmer from the Wimmera Mallee, that's down in Victoria, where there's hardly any trees, and they looked at that straight away and say, hell, where do I get those soil moisture probes from? And um, I said, mate, it's easy if you just stick to the made ones. You never get trees down there anymore. But... Um, if there's anyone interested in beehives, you know, you can become a Dr. Doolittle when you start hooking things up. What I've got there is a beehive with a set of scales under it. And every day, pick up the zigzag of the bees leaving the hive. There's 4,000 bees in that hive. They leave every day and go and forage and the hive weight goes up and up and up. And every now and then, you'll find, as I found, is that the old queen inside gets sick of the joint and she leaves and takes the bees with her. You can see them swarm, and then you can see them requeening. There's a beehive talking to us. Now, we've got 10,000 beekeepers in the country, 50 hives on average. That's, that's, um, that's half a million beehives, and most beekeepers spend 80 to 90% of their time on the road visiting hives. They have no idea what to see at the end. So surely connected things in our landscapes and our farms will make a big difference. And, of course, animals as well. We've got 77 million sheep in this country and about 50 million cattle and counting. You know, every one of our animals is, is potentially trackable, and that's where the technology is going. Meet Livestock Australia, who is the equivalent of Sugar Research Australia for the livestock sector, was absolutely inundated with applications to develop tracking devices for animals. It's just exploded, and the whole cattle industry is going to be revolutionised. And we are now in a position where we can create yield maps from our cattle, our sheep, just by tracking them around when they're eating 
and watching their weight gain as they go over walkover weigh systems. And that's a yield map for a mob of sheep. You know, between 20 and 200 kilos per hectare per year of annualised weight gain. You know, it's the same stuff that turned you guys on in the 90s with your yield monitors in the grains industry. Sorry, sugar industry, I don't quite think we've got a yield monitor yet. But this is the stuff that turned the industry on. And, um, and it's coming your way and it's coming to the livestock sector. And if you can see dots on a map, you can move them around. We can virtually fence our animals. You put an ear tag or a collar on with a GPS coordinate relative to a line in the sand and they won't cross. Why? Because you're going to give them a whopping great zap if they do. Hence my high voltage background coming back. Thank you very much. But we know we can control, control and contain animals. Potentially, we've just got to deal with the animal ethics. So, you know, the Internet of Things that we talk about is more than just telemetered water systems and maybe something hooked up to your irrigation system. It's going to revolutionise the way we farm. We'll have a LiDAR unit, a little laser that pulses every time something walks through the gate. So you can do the volumetrics, you can estimate the weight, you can even infer the wool, the wool production on it live on the hoof. Now, there's a question I want to ask. Let me describe this photo to you. Both of those photos are what we call a colour infrared photo. It's taken using a camera that allows us to look in the near infrared. We can't see it with our eyes, but it's just a little bit beyond the red colour. On the left is a canola field, on the right in fact is a canola field. You can see on the left the trees, those funny blobby things on the blue background, and you can see where the trees are withdrawing the water from the crop, and the crop's looking a little, uh, a little less vigorous. Um, and of course you can see the car parked in the right. Now this is a key lesson, a key message I give to anyone that wants to innovate in agriculture. Apart from the fact that there's a little colour difference, we're dealing with colour infrared image, same sort of resolution. What's the big difference between the two? Anyone want to hazard a suggestion? Anyone have a crack? You know I'm going somewhere, don't you? 20 years. That's it. That's it. So what have we innovated, how have we innovated in the sector using remote sensing in 20 years? We've gone from an airborne video that would weigh 28 kilos, and I used to carry it in the, in the back of a 1967 Piper, to a small handheld camera that I can put into a drone, which I can only fly legally within line of sight, and not above 400 feet, so I can't fly beyond line of sight. And I'm still taking the same photos. So where's the innovation? There is a tech innovation dimension, which is critical. But where else is the innovation? Can we pick out nutrient stress from water stress? Can we pick out individual pest vectors? Can we pick out specific diseases? In other words, we've got smarter in the tech, but we haven't innovated when it comes to what we do with it. Our delivery systems are better. We've got some really slick uh, systems for delivering satellite imagery and so forth. And of course, the UAVs, we're back in the 1900s now, and this is a really exciting time to be. I mean, you know, we would strap wings on anything, really, UAVs. And of course, um, it was more than just um, spray and pray, really. I mean, we were doing early experimentation on autonomous systems, but there was a lot of prey involved. But, you know, it's an exciting time to be in this space because the tech innovation is what's really driving us along. But do you realise, if I hire a UAV operator to come and fly my farm in Armidale, it costs me about the same as it does to hire a camera in a, in a Cessna to do it. Why? Because I've got two people come along, I've got a ute, How's the weather? Oh, I've got to drive an hour because I'm flipping out to Moree tomorrow. I'll come back the next day. Excuses, excuses, delays, delays, delays. So you know what? The, the encumbrance of the technology is still not hugely different. Not until each and every one of us can get to have one in our glove box and fly it and do some meaningful stuff with it. But I've got to salute people, some of which you, whom of you may realise. We're, we're back in the Orville Wright days in aviation. You've got people like Mark Xavier, VTOL Aerospace, based in Brisbane, you know, um, started flying the very earliest bats in the early 90s. Um, uh, Lisi Felderhoff from up in the Atherton Tablelands doing some revolutionary stuff. These are old photos. We've all got long hair and baggy jeans, for God's sakes. John Heat from Saudi. I mean, they, these are bloody obsessed. But that's what's given us what we have today. Now we need to wait for the legislation to catch up so that we can actually use the damn stuff. And just like 1906, you know, these magnificent men and women are digging their fair share of wells just like the Wright brothers did back, you know, 120 years ago. And so we're le they're learning hard lessons and helping us out on the way. But you get these drones and you can do some wonderful stuff. And this is something on my little parcel of land at home that my 14-year-old son did for me. 
took a 3D map of the whole place and estimated the carbon in the trees. You know, on the left I've got scientists, highly paid scientists, flying drones around estimating the weight of sheep. And on the right hand side I've got local farmers, a farmer in particular who left school at year 8 that's flying a drone, doing 3D volumetrics on pasture, cutting the pasture, baling it and weighing it on the weighbridge at the local tip and coming back with pasture yield maps. So this is technology for all ages and all backgrounds and it's pretty inspirational stuff. And this is something that Mark Xavier provided with me just last week. This is only a week and a bit old. Can anyone tell me what that is? I'll give you a fair bit of latitude, I know. <clears throat> That's a rat at one o'clock in the morning in a row crop, not far away. Right? That was a drone that was doing a nighttime um, line of sight, which beggars belief, how do you do line of sight at night time? But lots of lights on it. Pest survey um, and with the thermal camera system, picking up pests in crops. Now, what's particularly intriguing about this photo is sure it's a thermal infrared paint of a rat in a row crop. But more importantly, it was done at night with a commercial organisation, a non-military one. So in other words, we're now moving towards reality in terms of we're going to get meaningful tools. We can deploy drones at night to do sentinel work, wild dogs, pigs in the sugar, pests and so forth. And, um, and Mark assures me that they've just been, they're just applying at the moment to do a beyond visual line of sight at night. Which, how do you figure that out? But anyway, it's getting exciting. Now, many of you in Precision Ag, of course, are probably more familiar with technology like this, the old EM38. Who, who's familiar with that? Yes, yeah, so there you go, about 25% in the room, right? I like the EM38. It's been around since the yield monitor days in the 90s. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with it, you sort of tow it around the back of a quad bike. It's a little magnetic coil and pulses the ground and tells you how conductive the soil is. And you can tell a whole lot of, li a whole lot of uh, scenarios around what the data really means. But the thing I like about EM38 in particular is what you see is what you get. You, are, you see it, it's a piece of cherry wood. In fact, the 85% of the cost of that device is in fact the native cherry wood that's make, that makes up the antenna. But more importantly, not only do you get to do the measurements with it, but it's actually bloody handy to do the ground truthing with as well. Because it does double as a damn good shovel if you really get caught out. <clears throat> but it took me about a day to dig that, I might say. So. You know, with, with robotics, um, which I'll touch on shortly, with big data, with artificial intelligence. My father had always had the last word on artificial intelligence. He said, artificial intelligence is absolutely no substitute for natural stupidity. And um, he's actually right, because look around the room here. Look at the wealth of experience and the ideas. We have people growing rice up here, for goodness sakes. I mean, that's innovation. Oh, yeah, sure, we did it 40 years ago but we're doing it again now. Why? Because we have people that can tap into the memory banks of those that have thrived and tried things. And I think that's a lesson we have to carry with us, that you can only be so, do so much in our agricultural world. And we've seen the movie, we've seen the 3D version of it out here earlier today. This is part of our future. But I should point out, and, we, and we've done some of our own trials with robotic tractors, that, um, that as, as glitzy as this technology is, and we know it works, we can drive things around without, without anyone in the cab, but you cannot drive them around without anybody outside the cab. And this is a challenge we've got. I think it was mentioned this morning in question time um, in relation to the fact there is no legislation around the use of robotics on farm. And that's a real problem. In fact, that's a terrible problem. We have the same problem in virtual fencing when we try to control animals without physical fences. There is no legislation, for example, in the state of Victoria, which means they won't even let you think about doing it. It's not as if, if you have legislation, you've got something you can attack, something you can work around. If you have no legislation whatsoever, you have nothing to go at. And that's the biggest challenge we got. We don't have the regulatory frameworks for our smart farming future. We only just completed a trial up here towards the end of last year, here in Mackay, just up the road using a robotic tractor and a complete satellite guidance system. No on-ground GPS infrastructure. On the left of that big photo is the wheel tracks from an from a RTK GPS. On the right is the wheel tracks from a satellite only um, driven guidance solution. This sort of stuff may help us break the impasse. And the, the most important thing about the trial that we conducted last year um, with, with, with a team from pharmacists and with some support from Sugar Research Australia just up the road here was that we demonstrated that we could match using satellite only 
you know, the two to three centimetre cross track error, and we can get the, the warm up time of this technology down to a few minutes. When we first did the trial 12 months ago, it was more than 40 minutes to get the thing to lock in and work. So things are moving really quick. The thing about robotics is that we've got to bear in mind, and this is my earlier point I made to you about what are we going to leave our kids. Now, I had to get in and sanitise this slide. I made a ripper and my wife absolutely went nuts when she saw it. She said, you're not putting that up. But anyway, I think you'll get the gist. If you look on the left, that is a new robotic technology for sizing chests based on palpitations. <laughs> I did have a few other augmentations on it, but my wife made me delete them. And the point of this is, is that we don't want to let a technological solution take the fun out of the job. We want it to take the work and the drudgery out of the job, but not the fun out of the job, right? You get the drift, huh? Now, let's talk about phones and connectivity. I'm nearly at the end, sorry. I noticed you haven't taken a bite since I started, and that's fantastic. That's really good, because either have I. Um, look at smartphones. We're all being connected. Now, did you all hear the news today that 30% of Australians have access to NBN? Now, can anyone that has got access to NBN put their hand up, please? Just stick your hand up. Oh, gee, that's not bad. Well, that's almost 30%, almost. Okay, I want to okay, ever put your hand up if you haven't got NBN. That's more like it. Okay, everyone's been connected. We have the ability now to collect data from our farmers live and more importantly to drive smart tools back into our phones. Right? You know, but it's not lost on me that when you look at all the rural and regional telecommunications um, kerfuffle, you know, 99% of Australians will have access to a reliable mobile phone. Right? But of course, only 30% of the country is covered. And if you look, zoom in, you'll find that we only have three mobile network operators and there's almost 100% redundancy, or I should say 300% redundancy where they, where they are set up. And it's only the big one left that's got a little bit of footprint out in the bush. And it's an interesting scenario when you look at the numbers associated with mobile telecommunications, no one makes money out of putting mobile fan towers up in the bush. No one at all. Do you know why they put mobile towers up in the bush? So that more city people will subscribe because they know they can make a call when they go to the bush. That's it. Okay. So, you know, we need to turn things over on their heads big time. And in fact, I want to I re read this story. I've got to get the written version, right? Because I might trip over myself here. All right. Um, now, do you, all, do you all remember Time Team, the show on ABC? You know, digging up stuff and all that stuff. You know Time Team? You understand? Does anyone know much about archaeology? Even better. Cool. Cool. Okay. The trick with archaeology is that the deeper you dig down, the, the further back in time you go. It's a little bit like space. The further up you look, the further back in time you go. Okay. Now I'm going to read this because this is a couple of quotes that I got. Okay. Okay. Now... Having dug to a depth of just 10 feet last year, British scientists found traces of copper wire dating back 200 years underground. Couple of people, huh? Now, the conclusion of these archaeologists is that their ancestors had some form of rudimentary telephone network dating back you know, more than 150 years ago, digging down 10 feet. Now, of course, the Americans, when they heard that, thought, oh, hang on, we're going to have a better look at home. So they scratched around and they got down to 20 feet and they were ripping up whole bits of copper too. And they said, hey, look, not only do we have a rudimentary telephone network, but it was almost 100 years earlier than the Brits did. Now, back home, a couple of the locals thought, well, shit, we've got to do better than that. Scratching their heads. And they gave, so they grabbed the backhoe and shot out the back of the paddock and they're scratching around everywhere. And in fact, they got down to 30 feet down and couldn't find, found bugger all. And that was an absolute winner because we realised that a hundred years before the Yanks, we'd already gone wireless. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, OK. Well, you have to bear in mind that the, 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 the way ag tech is going and the way we're innovating isn't about tomorrow, it's not even about today, it's about what we started about 10 years ago. And you, you have to realise that despite the fact that a lot of the innovations that we're hearing uh, coming over the horizon, most of them were seeded back in the 90s. And yet, precision agriculture, if you take it for an example, you know, maybe 60 or 70% of our grain growers use it, for example, but on the whole, on average across Australia, it'd be less than 30%. So in other words, we have to 
take the time to look back over our shoulder and bring the rest of the populace forward with us. So as much as we have technical challenges um, or technical opportunities that, that we can use to meet challenges, we've got to actually never lose sight of the fact that events like this, Ag Catalyst for an example, um, are an essential component of actually bringing the rest of the population forward. So we need, in some respects, not to go faster into the future, but to just walk a little slower to let the rest catch up. And so education, outreach, is just as important when it comes to communicating what we've done and what we're doing today as it is about dreaming about what we have to do in the future. So it's going to be a mixed bag.